Chris got it. Um, Here. All right. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for joining us for Wildlife Wednesday again, everyone. So, oops, give my computer a moment to catch up with me. So some virtual engagement guidelines tonight. Um, I do ask that you keep your video off and also your sound off, turn your mute on. Um, and what that'll do is it's going to help increase our bandwidth tonight. We do have a lot of videos being played. And so without having your video showing, it'll help kind of preserve the energy. So um, that'll be helpful for us. And do view the presentations in full screen mode. You'll get the full effect, uh, the whole idea that way. And if you have any sort of questions tonight, please do throw them into the chat and we'll get to them in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation this evening. Um, so have no fear, we will get to them if we have the time towards the end. Um, but mention things as they come up in your head. And just most importantly, we hope you have a good time and that you learn something new. Uh, again, thank you to all of you joining tonight. And if you are a member with the Alaska Wildlife Alliance, I thank you especially because you help make these Wildlife Wednesdays free for the public. So thank you very much if you are a member and you are here tonight. We have three chapters throughout the state and each has a Wildlife Wednesday once a month, October through April. And this is for the Southeast chapter tonight. So we have a chapter down, down in Juneau and this will be on behalf of them. We have three pillars with the work that we do with AWA. Uh, we have a lot of citizen science. Currently we have beluga whale monitoring in the Cook Inlet and the Alaska Wildlife Alliance co-hosts the Kenai and Kasilaf River sites uh, as part of the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership. Um, there are several partners that take part in that. And if you're interested in monitoring for those endangered whales, please visit our website and you can learn more or you can visit akbmp.org. Um, we also do uh, beach seabird monitoring down on the peninsula. If you're interested in that, can also be found on our website or on COAST's website, C-O-A-S-S-T. And in Southeast, maybe you have seen our bear aware posters on the electric bus system. Uh, that's just one piece of uh, education that we do. We do a whole bunch in the state, but um, we do that. We do tabling, we do wildlife walks, and we have these Wildlife Wednesdays. So really are involved in sharing information about wildlife. And we also have quite a bit of advocacy. So for example, we filed a polar bear lawsuit to uh, better protect the Beaufort Sea polar bears. And that happened this past fall. And uh, maybe you've heard of our Map the Trap program. Um, if you see a trap on or very close to multi-use trails, um, we are asking folks to report that because there is no formal system marking those and we're trying to get better awareness on that because that is an issue um, over time in the last few years, especially where pets and people are getting caught. So we're trying to help um, mitigate those concerns, those issues. So um, do report anything you find online with um, that is on our website. Uh, just some pieces of news that we have going on. Um, we have a whole bunch, but perhaps you have heard our uh, proposal 199 to request setbacks from uh, trapped set setbacks off of multi-use trails in the Matsu uh, did not pass this past spring, um, but we are, the saga continues and <laughs> we're going to continue being involved in work with that and trying to just ask for setbacks off of um, popular trails so that everyone's recreating safely. Um, and if you wanna learn more information on that, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website and you can also find us on social media um, to be updated with that as, as things develop over time. So visit us on those resources. Um, again, we're beluga monitoring. We also have some species spotlights, kind of some species blogs that are being written up by some interns of ours. Very exciting to read those. And we had our climate adaptation workshop this past February. So if you want to learn more about how we're adapting to climate change in Alaska, you can, um, you can find out more on our website. So events that we have coming up, we have these Wildlife Wednesdays. This is the last month. We have two more after this. 
Um, we also have bears, birds, and beers wildlife walks in the Anchorage area coming up this summer. So be on the lookout for news on that in our newsletter and our social media. Uh, we have the Beluga Whale Monitoring. Again, you can join at akbmp.org. We have a Marine Mammal Forum coming to Homer in April. So if you want to learn more um, about marine mammals in Homer, you can visit us there. We'll be there in person presenting, but we will also be uh, streaming the symposium presentations virtually. So there's a lot more I can speak on that, but it's very exciting. And I encourage you to visit our website to uh, find out more on that. And I can throw the link into the chat there, but that's coming up. And Wildlife Wednesdays are recorded. You can watch more online and you can also watch the recordings and you can see the presentations of the Climate Adaptation Workshop also on our website. Thank you to our members again. And if you're interested in supporting our work, any of the stuff you've seen just this evening, um, you can visit our website there, akwildlife.org slash action one. And I'll throw the link into the chat for that. Um, so $35 a year, and it is worthwhile. All that goes towards our programs. And if you would like to support in other ways, you can do that with some of the resources that are there on the bottom of the screen. And that's it. I'm going to hand it over to Bob. And thank you so much for your time, everyone, for being here. Great, I can see it on my end. Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> well, thanks so much for inviting me, Kelsey. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm uh, really pleased by the amount of work you do and Alaska Wildlife Alliance does uh, on uh, uh, making people aware of what's going on in Alaska and also uh, helping to uh, preserve it. I really enjoy filming creatures in Alaska and then trying to learn about their behavior and their diff different connections and importance to our environment. And I've, over the years, I've taken videos of almost uh, 2000 uh, uh, natural history events in the state. And I post these videos on Vimeo. And what's interesting is Vimeo keeps records of the number of people that watch the videos and also what country they live in. So I thought it might be fun to look at a few of the more popular ones. These aren't necessarily the ones that I like the best, but uh, it, they seem to, for some reason, uh, get the most views. Also, I post the ones that tell an interesting story on my website, uh, naturebob.com. And I put, links to important and interesting information about the subject under the video. So you can uh, click on it and uh, maybe get a scientific report or something about the subject. And all of these videos are free to use for educational and scientific information. And most of the books that uh, I've been involved in co-authoring or writing are now available as PDFs for uh, free downloading also from the uh, my website. Now, of interest is this is one of the more popular videos that people uh, enjoy looking at. Uh, and it's perhaps because of the word poop in the, uh, in the title, I guess it gets people's attention. But uh, we were out with our grandson and, and his dad and uh, going through the, walking through the woods and there was a pile of bear poop there. And he asked his dad, uh, why do bears poop? And I thought that was uh, stimulating enough that uh, it would make an interesting uh, video. And 
I sort of apologize for this first uh, uh, video. Uh, it's uh, might be kind of gross to some people, but it's the best video I've ever taken of a bear pooping. So I had to include it. Their poop attracts a huge numbers of these tail dropper slugs, uh, and I hard to believe that there's so many in the uh, in the forests uh, that come out and to feed on them, and also lots of springtails, which are very important in the uh, uh, soil for, and then it attracts these dryomyza flies, which are. Uh, an important insect for pollinating a couple orchids uh, in Alaska. And they also help distribute lots of uh, berry plants. And Richard Carsonson did a test with a uh, blueberry. Uh, and uh, he found that uh, one pile of uh, poop uh, grew about 150 small blueberry plants. They didn't all survive, but it was a good distribution. And the northern ground cone is very important for, for bears, uh, especially uh, later in the year. And this shows that uh, bears also eat uh, blowfly maggots. Uh, they will lick them off salmon carcasses. And the next one is uh, Why Do Salmon Jump, which was an exciting one for me. Uh, here in Juneau at Amalga Harbor, there is a uh, seine fishery that uh, fishes for both uh, chum and sometimes pink salmon. And I think this, most of the video here shows uh, chums uh, jumping and occasionally pink salmon jump. What excited me about it was uh, seeing the same fishery in the uh, background. It was nice to get the uh, some images of them actually uh, hauling in the seine and putting the fish on board the boat and with the salmon jumping in the foreground. But my overall conclusion was, I don't know why they jump. I got into the scientific literature and looked at a lot of different reports. There are some theories out there, but uh, one report that I really liked was this uh, one given by a, uh, a local biologist, Bill Hurd, on the life history of pink salmon. 
And he talks about how they go about jumping and so on. But what I really liked was at the end of his uh, uh, report, he says the reasons for this behavior are unknown. But when you read about the uh, salmon as they approach uh, spawning, they go through a lot of uh, increased and rapid hormonal changes. And uh, I think maybe they're just excited about spawning. This was kind of a fun one. Uh, uh, Bufflehead males uh, in their courtship rituals, they bob their heads up and down, uh, trying to attract females to them. And a lot of competition goes on, a lot of head bobbing. This is one uh, next to a female, hoping that she will present himself or herself for, for mating, and she eventually did. Apparently, he was a good head bopper. This is a project I worked on. Uh, uh, mostly, I got my information from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where they uh, uh, studied each of these uh, seabirds, and then I picked up from the from their reports uh, uh, the uh, depth at which the different birds dive. Our gold dive ducks are fairly shallow divers. They really like to feed on uh, blue mussels and they don't have to go very far to get them. But you notice they use uh, only their feet in going down. And they can hover over a mussel bed and grab a couple of mussels and bring them to the surface and swallow them. Our marble murelet goes for fish and it can go down about 125 feet. And I've got a video of it, I didn't show it there, but they use their wings, they fly real fast in the water, chasing the fish. This is our deepest, deepest uh, diver, supposedly in Alaska. And the literature claims that they can dive down to 600 feet below the water surface, which is almost unbelievable. But you can see they really use their wings. And their wings, the way they're shaped, are probably perfect for uh, diving underwater. This was a fun project. Uh, I put uh, some food in a container that had a snap lid on top. And I put it out where crows were, and then I put it out where ravens were. And these are the results. Crows typically just pecked at the uh, container for food. And in the time I spent with them, I never, never saw a crow get into the uh, container at all. Spent their entire time pecking at the uh, outside.
the ravens, when they came to the container, they immediately go to the lid. They didn't do any pecking on the uh, container. They just trying to get the lid off. So they really understood. This was one of my favorite photos I took of, uh, I got a uh, empty cup of Raven's Brew coffee and then I put some coffee in it and I put it out and uh, where Raven's were and every Raven would come over and gently pry off the lid and then stick his uh, beak in there and uh, drink some coffee. This was uh, a very interesting project uh, where I would put a, uh, a GoPro camera on a, attach it to a dive weight, and then I'd go out at a minus tide and put it out in an area where uh, seals were normally present. And then I would uh, pick it up the next day uh, at a minus tide and I had a battery on it that would run for nine hours in the video mode. And you can see what, uh, what the camera caught here. All of the seals that would come down and, and sleep often would uh, stay there for about 20 minutes before waking up and going back up to the surface. And to avoid too much boredom, I shortened a few of them uh, considerably. Uh, just amazing to me how they uh, kind of get together and uh, some of them sleep uh, on top of each other and uh, right next to each other. And, uh... well, some of what I see underwater, I don't know why. I try to find uh, information in the literature and talking to seal biologists and haven't had any luck, but they're very curious. And sometimes they'll come up and smell the GoPro and look at it. Maybe they really want their picture taken. These uh, spotted tussock moths, uh, become very numerous uh, in a lot of places here, especially in Juneau. They like to feed on uh, alder leaves and they run across the ground and everything looking for a place to uh, build their cocoon. And uh, I wanted to get a video of one and they typically build their cocoon on the underside of a rock. And uh, so in general, I've learned that with insects, if you wait until they start doing something, then you can uh, approach them and, uh, and work with them a lot better. But if you try to approach them before they start something, they usually uh, run away. But this one, had started its cocoon under this rock. And so I turned it over and put a camera on it. And it actually was spinning the cocoon for almost eight hours. And during that whole time, it never stopped once working at it. And they, from what I've read, they produced a, a silk that uh, they used to weave their cocoon. 
but then occasionally they'll also pull those uh, white uh, hairs off of them and intertwine them in the cocoon. And these uh, caterpillars are, are quite toxic. And so they can walk around in the uh, open and not worry about being, uh, being eaten. But once they pupate in the cocoon, they lose that toxin. And uh, some birds have learned to target them, especially chickadees, and they will uh, open up the cocoon and, uh, and eat the pupa inside. And that's part of the reason I think why they typically build their cocoons uh, under rocks and try to, try to hide them the best they can. One thing that's really fascinating about these moths is they, they, they overwinter, of course, in their cocoon, and then they'll emerge in the spring as adults, and then they fly about and mate, and then the adults lay their eggs, usually uh, near alder trees. But uh, the adults uh, can uh, eat, emit a clicking sound, which interferes with bat sonar. And I would uh, love someday to be able to uh, set up a situation where I could uh, record that and uh, see what happens. I hope this isn't too boring. I've speeded it up uh, 64 times so you could uh, uh, get a, a feeling for what, uh, what this caterpillar is doing. One thing that's interesting, they, when they feed on the alder leaves, if it's raining, the caterpillar typically will go on the underside of the alder leaf uh, and the rain is hitting on top and then it's, it still eats the leaf uh, from the underside. Those tiny insects are. <laughs> hmm. Wonder why it stopped. Oh, well. Uh, I don't even remember what this one is. Let's see. Oh, yeah, this is a uh, aphids typically will feed on fireweed plants. And sometimes you, I seen looking at fireweed and seeing kind of a dark area at the top, they will uh, show the uh, aphids uh, uh, feeding on the plant. But occasionally what's exciting is to see the uh, red ants will sometimes sort of tend the aphids and supposedly they will help protect them from certain predators. And uh, in, in return, the aphid will, uh, will give the, uh, the red ant some, uh, some, uh, some sap to, uh, to eat. And you can see here the ant uh, 
with its front paws is stimulating the aphid. And then here, the uh, little bit of uh, sap is coming out its rear end and the uh, ant is licking it. And also read in the literature that some ants will take the aphids down into the ground for the winter and then uh, bring them back up on the plant uh, the next year. The, uh, the ants can't really protect them from birds eating the aphids, and, uh, but they seem to be fairly important for the yellow ump warblers, particularly the juveniles on the left. And that's a, uh, an adult yellow ump warbler on the right uh, feeding on the aphids. Truffles are that fungus that's uh, real important in the, uh, for the health of our forests. And from what I've learned about them is that they uh, present a certain amount of um, mycorrhizal uh, situations where the uh, uh, forest trees, the conifers, uh, uh, it enables them to grow better and to get more nutrients. And some of the studies indicate that without truffles, our forests wouldn't be all that healthy. And so I was quite interested to see uh, if I could document uh, some of the information about them. That's a, a, a local truffle called a deer truffle, which apparently even deer eat. But typically, uh, flying squirrels are one of the ones that uh, dig them up. And also voles, redback voles, uh, dig them up and eat them. And apparently, for a truffle to reproduce, it has to be eaten by one of these creatures. And then when it's uh, passed through their digestive system, and pooped, uh, then the truffle can reproduce. And there's a whole study uh, done uh, uh, by a person that did a doctoral thesis on the redback bowl and found out it was a very critical animal for the health of our forests because of it eating the uh, truffles. And I noticed that red squirrels also dig them up and eat them, but I couldn't find much in the literature about uh, their benefits uh, to the forest, but I suspect it might be somewhat similar. Truffles uh, emit a very strong odor, which attracts uh, these uh, animals to uh, feed on them. And to work on this project, I, I discovered that I had to uh, bury the truffles mostly at, in the evening because the squirrels were so, uh, would commonly grab them during the daytime. but they're not too active at night. And this is a flying squirrel. And they're apparently one of the most important uh, small mammals uh, for the health of our forests and uh, because they really uh, concentrate on uh, eating truffles. One thing I've noticed is that uh, at certain, especially a little bit later in the year, the bears uh, often only choose the female salmon. And quite interesting how they work with them. And this is a young looking for a female. And they usually pick them up and kind of smell them and uh, 
look at them and they seem to be able to know fairly quickly whether it's a male or female. And one thing that surprised me, I've, I've looked at and filmed a large number of bears looking for female salmon and how gentle they are with the, uh, with the males. And when, when they find a female, they typically take it up uh, on a bank or, or away from the stream. And then rather than uh, tear open the body, something that I've observed actually press on the body, which extrudes the eggs. On one stream, uh, I looked at uh, about 17 carcasses that were quite a ways from the bank and none of them had been opened up, and all of them were females. Uh, and I suspected that, that they were all brought up there by the bears, and they were getting the eggs out in this manner by pressing on them. I suspect the eggs are uh, quite nutritious for them. Or maybe like humans with caviar, they just like the flavor. I think I would rather eat an egg than a than the body. But what I find interesting is when an egg falls on the ground, it gently goes over and picks it up. This was an interesting event because the uh, king eiders are very rare in the Juno area. And there was a couple that appeared amongst a uh, flock of uh, surf scoters. And I was trying to figure out why. And the scoters were very, very adept at uh, diving down and getting uh, blue mussels and bringing them up to the surface. And uh, they sometimes thrash them around. Uh, before they swallow them. But what I noticed was that the uh, eiders would watch and every once in a while, uh, a scoter would uh, throw a mussel uh, away from it itself and the uh, eider would go over and grab it. And I don't have any film of it, but occasionally the eiders would uh, attack the surf scoters and uh, grab a muscle from them. But in about a half an hour of filming, I never once saw the eiders dive, which I thought was kind of interesting. I'm not sure what this one is, but Oh, the, uh, a, fun, uh, a fun one where I was uh, trying to film uh, dippers uh, diving underwater. And uh, I would sit on the bank and watch them. And they often would, uh, this is during when salmon were spawning, they would uh, dive in these little woody debris piles. And what they were getting were the aquatic insects. And from what I've read, when salmon spawn, they displace uh, huge numbers of aquatic insects. And uh, because a, a lot of them live in the, uh, in the spawning gravel. And what I would see in the, looking at the videos real carefully is I would see a lot of uh, 
of the insects, uh, particularly mayflies uh, floating and swimming downstream. And when they would see the debris pile, they would uh, immediately swim down and, and go into the uh, woody debris. And the dipper certainly knows that. But this is one, uh, one good uh, documentation of the value of woody debris in streams, uh, uh, especially for aquatic insects. And it's a place where salmon don't spawn, so they're safe during the uh, spawning season. And then from what I've read that uh, after the salmon quick spawning, then the insects uh, redistribute themselves uh, through the stream. And the, uh, that kind of silvery sheen that you see on the dipper is the oil from the oil that they take out of there. They've got a uh, oil gland near their tail and they oil their feathers to uh, uh, keep them waterproof. And when you're filming them, it looks like they, they have a silver color. And when you think about the value of aquatic insects for salmon, uh, you really begin to appreciate these uh, places where the uh, aquatic insects can uh, survive. This is a, uh, something I've observed uh, on, filmed on three different occasions. And, uh, I hope to be able to document it uh, better, but uh, I didn't realize quite what was happening until the, uh, uh, the raven showed me. But these staghorn sculpins were at low tide were living in the sand. And that actually isn't what the uh, raven is, uh, is that interested in. But you'll see in a minute what it actually, uh, is after. It pulls up a half of a horse clam shell and the shell has is full of the eggs from a staghorn sculpin. And what it what it's doing is it takes uh, takes all the eggs and then flies off with them probably to its nest to uh, to feed their young. And I've tried to find documentation of this in the literature and I can't find anything. And I've talked to several people that study sculpins and they say they don't know this. But this is what might be happening is that the sculpin lays her eggs on the head of the male and then covers them with a horse clam shell and then the male protects them until they hatch. That would be pretty bizarre to, uh, to actually really document that. It would be new to, I think, pretty well new to science. And this is the last one. And this one has gotten uh, the most views of any of the videos, about 9,000. And I never really knew quite, quite why, but beavers have become very interesting and important uh, in the environment, including uh, helping with the climate change and uh, providing food for other creatures and on and on. But this was a... Uh, This is not a video that I took, but the uh, Forest Service had a camera in a beaver lodge there uh, near Mendenhall Glacier. And it was really a well documentation about what happened inside the lodge. 
And they allowed me to um, download the videos. And then I went through all of their videos that they had and just extracted the little parts of it to uh, illustrate a certain behavior. And Mink often came into the lodge. And uh, a couple of times, the mink actually brought a fish into the lodge and ate it. And this is uh, showing how beavers groom themselves. And they have an oil gland that they uh, also take, uh, take oil and spread it uh, throughout their fur to help waterproof it. And their hind leg has a special uh, claw, which is kind of serrated to uh, help in the uh, grooming process. They spend a lot of time uh, grooming themselves. And uh, and this shows them one eating uh, some wood inside the lodge. They seem to really like the uh, the surface of the wood. Uh, they'll usually eat that first. But one thing that really surprised me was uh, how they uh, make their bed. And uh, And in a minute, you'll see them uh, where they're getting those uh, uh, bedding strips. They actually take a piece of wood and uh, peel off little tiny strips of it to make their bed out of. And I never knew that until I uh, saw the video. And I'm not sure this is well documented in the literature either. But I'd read that they typically eat their uh, poop. And uh, so I was excited to uh, see a clip of one actually doing that. And they eat the first poop they make because it still has some nutritional qualities to it. And then the second time they poop, uh, uh, they don't eat that part. And another thing that was interesting is uh, beavers will sometimes groom each other and they always do it by mouth rather than by their uh, feet. And I think that might have uh, be related to some sort of social. Uh, activity. They typically sleep together, sometimes on top of each other, often uh, side by side. And from what I've read, the female is usually lighter colored than the male. So I kind of assume that the, uh, the one on the left there is a female and the one on the right is a male. And this is a fun video that someone uh, on the internet allowed me to use uh, the little kits inside the lodge.
Well, thanks so much. Uh, I really enjoyed sharing that. Uh, Well, Bob, thank you so much. Um, this, some of your footage and the things you've seen, I feel like are like planet Earth, National Geographic <laughs> content. Some of that stuff I'd never ever seen before. Look at that. Um, like the sculpin and the raven was just fascinating. And the dipper, the perspective of the dipper underwater was so cool. I've seen them from surface, but never like that. Um, and the I'm, I'm always amazed by what a camera sees when a human's not nearby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the seals. Um, <clears throat> somebody had a question about the seals. Um, is there any concern? Like, do they do that frequently where they sleep on the bottom of the surface? Um, is there concern for predation because it seems risky to be? laying down there um is it safer to be on like a rocky outcropping above the surface of the water i suspect it is uh i haven't uh, been able to find out too much information about it uh, uh, but i i see them uh, uh, a lot of times you can tell that they 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 go down from the surface and then you never see them until about 20 minutes to a half an hour later, come back up and take a breath and then go back down. And uh, I'm sure it's a, in a sense, it's a lot safer and it certainly uh, uh, might be more comfortable. Yeah, it'd be like a big hug, <laughs> all that water pressure. Um, all right, uh, we have, uh, I guess I had one question about dippers. Do you know why they, do not have webbed feet? It seems like that would be an adaptation they would appreciate. Um, they use their wings to, to move around underwater and they seem to be very efficient at that. And uh, so I'm not sure that webbed feet would, uh, would help them that much, but uh, uh, they seem to be able to, to just, move their feet back and forth real quick uh, to run across the surface of the water. And, and they also, uh, the way their feet are shaped, they might be easier without webs to grab uh, rocks and stuff underwater. I can see that. And they are pretty terrestrial. Like they still hang out like a robin on the surface, like on the shoreline and stuff before they dive. So I suppose that would make sense. Um, uh, I have questions about the beaver videos, which were fascinating. Never seen that perspective before. And the baby beavers playing, um, very sweet. But what is the protocol for doing that type of photography in a beaver lodge like that? Do you need a permit typically for that? Uh, I suspect you, you, you certainly would. Uh, uh, the Forest Service at the glacier did a lot of work and brought in some uh, professional people to help set up the cam and so on. And, and it was uh, available for, for the public to watch. And unfortunately, it, uh, something happened and it stopped working and they haven't been able to uh, get it uh, up and going again. But it was one of the best uh, uh, lodge videos that I, filming that I'd seen. I was really impressed. Yeah, like the stripping of the bark bits of like making little splinters and shreds to make yeah. kind of a, a little nest that I would have never, never even thought of that. That was super amazing. Um, do, Beaver lodges sometimes get infested with fleas. Um, someone heard that that happens. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Uh, uh, do beaver lodges sometimes get infested with fleas? Someone asked. With what? Fleas, like, uh, like ticks and fleas. Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I see a lot of uh, 
of spiders living under the in the lodges, particularly the harvest men type uh, uh, type insects, and they may help uh, uh, keep the infections down. But I, 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 it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, another question, how do you keep humans from messing with the remote cameras? I've only had it happen once. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and what was interesting is uh, we had a, a friend and I had a camera on a, uh, an otter den and some people came out and saw it and they, uh, they took it, they took my camera, but his camera filmed what they were doing. <laughs> so we knew who took it. <laughs> but that's, that's the only time. Uh, usually try to put them in areas where not many humans are and uh, yeah. uh, try to disguise them. But, uh, I'm glad to hear you've only lost a camera once. <laughs> um, that's too bad. Um, and we're coming up on eight o'clock. I have one last question for you, um, kind of a fun one to end on, Bob. Um, what would be your favorite video that you've ever taken or your favorite wildlife encounter? Oh boy, there's so many of them. <laughs> um, my two favorite ones would be the uh, seals sleeping underwater. <laughs> And I got a lot of other videos of them uh, doing other things. Uh, sometimes they would go down and, uh, and with their forepaws grab a, a branch or a log that's underwater and then sleep uh, dangling up upwards. And uh, they a lot of interactions between uh, seals underwater. Uh, and then the raven digging up the sculpin. I mean. I didn't even know sculpins could live uh, uh, out of water like that, uh, that particular sculpin. And so it's, it's just fun to see that and then try to learn more. Yeah, it just triggers more questions half the time, it seems. <laughs> but it, um, yeah, I agree. Those were some really amazing. I think they were all amazing. All of your videos were amazing. Um, but those this, ones. This photo that's up now is my very favorite photo. It's a, a blowfly blowing a bubble. <laughs> and and the it's, it's, uh, those are pollen grains on its back. And they typically go into chocolate lilies uh, and uh, feed on their. Uh, pollen and nectar in them, and the chocolate lily emits a fetid odor to attract them. And of course, the blowflies, uh, they're the ones that go to salmon carcasses and other carcasses to lay their eggs. And so they're attracted to the uh, odor of that uh, particular flower. And anyway, it was exciting to get all that and then also have it blowing a bubble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd think a chocolate lily would smell a little more like chocolate, but <laughs> you gotta another name, somehow. another name for it, which I probably shouldn't say, is a, a outhouse lily. <laughs> oh no! Uh, well, that would do the job for getting the flies. Um, yeah, I love the little hairs and everything. So much detail. Very, very cool. Well, thank you. I think that concludes our evening. Um, Thank you, though, Bob, so much for all of your narration and sharing your your background on all those videos. Um, I learned so much. I'm just blown away. I feel like I need to call someone to <laughs> get your videos on National Geographic or something. Those are really amazing. So thank you for sharing. And for all, all of you who are here tonight, thank you so much for being here. And if you're a member, thank you for making this presentation free. It truly makes a difference. And if you're interested in becoming a member, you can visit our website. Um, I threw the link in the chat very early on and um, we'd love to have your support for these educational events. So thank you and 
thank you, Bob, for giving your time and volunteering your evening. It, it means a lot. And we'll be back next week for Wildlife Wednesday for the Anchorage chapter. And we will be having uh, Dan Ruth Roth present on migratory shorebirds. So that'll be pretty mind blowing as well. And uh, this, this was recorded this evening. So it'll be coming up on our YouTube, our website and our Facebook page. And you can share that if you would like or uh, send it to others who wanted to be here but couldn't make it tonight. But um, that'll be coming up tomorrow. So thank you again, everybody for being here, including you, Bob. Thank you. Thank Have you. Good evening. <laughs>